Robert, do you want to tell us a story about how you were when you got here for the film, or how you behaved, or rather not? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, you know, it's a funny story how I, we were talking, they were talking about how they, um, how you auditioned for the movie uh, with Reba and Michael, how, how I ended up in the movie. I was doing another film called Meet the Applegates with uh, Ed Bagley Jr. and Mike Tapuzian, our first assistant director, was a first assistant director. And I'll never forget, he comes up to me one day, he goes, you have to read the script. I just read the script. You, you have to be in this movie. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're the shit kid. You're the <laughs> you. I, 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 you're going to do this movie. And we were, in Wisconsin. Yeah, we were in Wisconsin. And we were in Appleton, Wisconsin. It was snowing. And I, I think I actually kind of forgot about it. And um, I got a call one day. And uh, I went into the, to the room. And I was talking to Ron, I think. I think it must have been like five, ten minutes. He was so nice. And he had done a, my sister had done an industrial film. With Ron. And he interrupted me like a few minutes later. He just said, do you want to do the movie? I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. And what's funny about that is how easy it was on the audition. And when you talk about the film and you talk about why people like it, my kids watch the movie now, okay? And I think there's a relatability factor to the film that really transcends just about everything. And I think it starts really with your relationship with Ron and Brett. And I think it really comes across in the tone of the movie and also the finished product of the movie. Thank you. Okay. We're going to switch to, uh, I, I think um, Glenn may have left with his brother, but he is, among other things, the uh, master of the uh, fan base um, website. And they had a few questions that we're going to work on here for a while. But, um, so Charlotte, this yeah. is a question. It doesn't actually say from whom. Most of these do say that. But uh, you were considered the earth mother of tremors. What did you do to develop the chemistry with Mindy? Oh, when, um, when I met that little girl, Ariana, and her parents, they were so down to earth. They were so sweet. Her mother was an artist. Um, Mindy was just as sweet as could be. I could, I could not let go of her, you know, the whole time we were there. Because, you know, we're, we're um, once the, the scary part starts and we're running for our lives or when we're on the roof, I just clung to her. And somebody mentioned to me, they'd seen it recently, said, you never took your hands off Mindy. You know, I was like protecting her so dearly. And then, Ten years later, um, I, I uh, quite often had a day job while I was acting, as most, a lot of us have to do. And I was in a production facility, and Nancy Roberts walked into the lobby, and she was the producer on the, the first film. And she said, Charlotte, what are you doing here? I said, well, I work here. And she said, we're thinking of doing another Tremors. Would you be available? I said, oh, give me a break. Of course I'd be available. <laughs> And so 10 years later, we went, we did Back to Perfection, and Ariana was available, so 10 years later, she played my daughter again. And it was a, it was a lovely reunion. We had so much fun, especially on the roof when the grab boy hits our box and we go, you know, screaming across the roof of the store. Um, but she was wonderful. And what was the movie she did right after that, the one? Yeah, um, Jurassic, Jurassic, Park. Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Wasn't she wonderful in that? She was so good. Thank you. Uh, Sean, we have another question. This one, this is just says from online fans. It says, we love Desert Jack in T3. He's the type of guy you'd have been with in Lone Pine. I'm not quite sure what that means. <laughs> if you want to move to Lone Pine, I can. I deny, I deny that. <laughs> And it says, was there anything shooting T3 that you couldn't do or didn't want to do? Oh, absolutely nothing. I was open to doing anything. When I got this uh, script and they're like Desert Jack, you know, like Michael said, like Western, I'm like, yep. Action, I'm, like, I'm in. Science fiction, yes. And comedy, I mean, that, I'm like, I'm in. I'll do it. And I share this story all the time. I've been blessed to continue to work and work. But I've never had the feeling like I had going to work like I did on Tremors. I would be in my car just jamming, ready, prepared, and on the way to set, and everybody's there like a family, 
and Michael sets an amazing tone for the artists, uh, where it's open, it's collaborative, everybody's there. Yes, he has his little notes, and he, like I'm, like, what do you got? What do you got today? What do you got? And um, and he comes up with an idea on top of the already great writing, and it just evolves. And I go, oh, and stuff comes out of my mouth. I'm like, let's go. This is, and it comes out to be a lot better. So for me, and going home, I remember going, oh my God, this is the best job ever. This is what you know you sort of pray for as a kid. You're playing make believe. You're with monsters. You're chasing them. You're out there having fun, and there's some comedy and action, adventure, doing a western. Um, it, it was it was heaven, and to be here and to see what it's evolved into today, um, and to see you all here, I, I, it blows me away. Um, but it is a testament to the franchise and the family and the tone that they've all set from day one. Um, and I'm just grateful to be a part of it and a little chapter in three. But yeah, I love it. I don't even know if I answered your question, <laughs> but guys, you need to get that out. That was kind of an interesting question. I know, I couldn't put it all together, but... Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. so thank you. Uh, and we can turn it over to the audience for questions now. Can You're going to have something? to shout out, I think. This is a commercial for, uh, oh, I'm commercial sorry. for Charlotte here. Uh, is your autobiography still available it's in print? It's right out there on the table. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Always giving, see? She, uh, yeah, this is a plug for her autobiography. She, uh, uh, she sent it to me a number of years ago. Yeah. And, uh, I, I was hoping you wouldn't just kill me. I read it thoroughly and enjoyed it, and apparently, uh, according to Charlotte, I drove Reba McIntyre insane. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, her autobiography's out here. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I heard... Reba and I were staying at the same motel here in Lone Pine, and she came back from the day of shooting in in uh, in Bert's uh, basement, and she was like, "Oh my God, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. He's such a perfectionist. Just shoot it again, shoot it again, change it, do it." She says, "I'm just exhausted." So that was that. I was I wrote about that in my book, but I also wrote the next day, I mean, uh, in the next page, that Bert was, he, you, you are a perfectionist. And that's what makes your character so wonderful and so intense. Also obsessive compulsive. Obsessive compulsive. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, yeah. afraid, I was afraid that you would read the book and read that part and go, well, heck with her and throw it across the room. But you did, you read to the next page and I told you how wonderful you were. Does anybody have a question they would like to ask? Okay, how about there? Where were your irresponsible parents? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was rumors I didn't have parents. Um, it's funny. Uh, you know, you know. I'll tell you a funny story how Melvin got his last name, Melvin Plug. You probably don't know this. But it's been 30 years. I can finally <laughs> reveal it. So at the time, the there was some kind of festival in town, and I, I was a little bit of a mischievous kid in real life. Um, I like to tell people I was just in character. A little bit. So I got in a little bit of trouble at the hotel. I don't, in those days, like, um, you know, my parents would go back and forth to LA, and I was here alone for some reason, and I got a little bit of trouble, and the hotel basically said, he can't stay here anymore. Yeah, yeah I said, what? And they called the other hotel, and there was only two that were open. And Mike Tapuzzi goes, what, do you, what did you do? What are we going to do? Okay, we're going to check you into another hotel as Melvin, but we need a last name. And they came up with the name Melvin Plug. <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed at the other motel as Melvin Plug <laughs> for the last three weeks of the movie. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Yes, these, um, um, Steve Wilson, Brent Maddock, had pretty much set the tone for who Bert was. 
they wrote him so well, so specifically, and we did four films together. When f five, and s five came along, and they were not associated with it, I, I felt a terrible um, responsibility to keep true to the voice of Bert that they had created. By that time, I had begun to understand it to an extent, never as well as the original Bert yeah. over here. <laughs> but still making the list of But uh, I felt protective of him. And I remember exactly what it was. There was a there was a, uh, a scene. There was a scene where what was the? I think they were talking about the graboid. Uh, I don't know something about the graboid queen or something like this was protecting uh, was protecting uh, the hive or the nest or something like this, and it was and it it was said it was like. Anyways, it was an, it was it was it was an incorrect fact, and the fact and he he had written this director had written and it's like the um, uh, the drone protecting the hive, or something like it was like the drone protecting the the hive and and I said and I uh, it just didn't sound right to me and I went and looked it up and we got on the sh we got on the shoot and I said I can't say that line. He said, why? I said, the drones are not uh, the soldiers. They don't protect the hive. They have, they have one purpose, and that's to inseminate the queen, and then they die. That's it. That's all they do. So I said, he said, well, just say the line. The drone protect I said, no. I said, when Bert says a thing, it's true. Because he's done his research. He knows, he knows, he knows a lot about little things, little specific things. And he's thoroughly researched it, so I can't, when I say something like that, it has to be true. And he was like, well, well, we can't stop, no, we can't. I said, no, no, I can't say, I'm not saying, well, then don't say the line. I said, I won't. <laughs> I, so we just talked about something about bees protecting the hive or something like that, but I said, it's incorrect. Bert does his homework. Uh, I can't say something that would not be factually true. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Steve, I'm sure that line came from you, when Bert is describing MREs and their foil packages, he says, it's foil. Plastic is not an oxygen barrier. Okay? That's true. You know, that's, you know, that's true. And I, so I couldn't say the drone was protecting the hive. Because such a thing does not happen in real life. And Bert would know better. So. I will have one more question, and then Melvin has a story. Melvin Plug has a story. <laughs> Mine's more of a statement, sir. Okay. I gotta say, when I grew up, I didn't have a lot of friends, you know, that's why Bert became my hero. Because when the ground was literally shaking out from under people, he didn't care how much crap they gave him, he didn't care, you know, if he didn't know him, he was the hero to everybody. And I thought, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Yeah! Well, I just, I just embody their creation, okay? So that's a, you have to take some credit. I take some credit. <laughs> I take some credit, but uh, but it, 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 the beginning is the word. And thank you. And I, and one of the things I, I, I love about Bert, one of these things these guys wrote in that was so wonderful, is he so. And I one of the reasons I think people can relate to him. He's so cocksure of himself. He's so prepared, and yet the ground keeps changing under him. Right. He's prepared for everything. Except an underground monster. <laughs> He's prepared for this, and then it changes. Suddenly they're flying. He thinks they're terrestrial, and they're flying. So he, in a way, as, as great as his preparation is, he's like all of us. We never get the full picture. And we always wind up, to some degree, as prepared as we are, falling on our faces. <laughs> that's the human condition. And that's very much Bert's condition. I think that's why we always love him, too, because... As much as he gets it right, he gets a lot wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and we have two poster um, uh, t-shirts out there. One is the worm, of course, and the other is Bert. So I recommend if you're big, if he's your big hero to get a t-shirt. Oh, I made my own home t-shirt for him to sign. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. And then, Robert, you have a story yeah. we'll close on. Yeah, it, it has to do with, it's actually kind of funny, speaking about a line you didn't want to say. Ron, are you? 
Do you, do you remember that line, way to go, dudes? Yeah. 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 So, I, I, you know, I was 15, and I was sure I was going to say this line, and, like, everyone was going to make fun of me at school for the rest of my life. <laughs> I was sure. There, I, I know what to say. I'm like, I'm not going to say this line. And Ron, he was like, hey, come on, Robert, just try it. And I said, no, come on, Ron, I can't. And he's like, why? And I'm like, explain it to him. He's like, okay. You know, just do it one time. Just one time. I go, okay, fine. What, like this? Way to go, dude. So he goes, okay, great, move on. And, look, <laughs> <laughs> and flash forward, it's like 30 years. And if you go on YouTube today, they're actually <laughs> taking that line. And do you know who, uh, they've, done, they've done mixes to the Backstreet Boys? <laughs> there's a famous DJ group called Sparta out of Germany who's actually taken Way to Go Dudes and turned it into like a house song. <laughs> it's, it's got like 50,000 hits, so I was wrong. <laughs>